I'm Peter Saltonstall, the President and CEO of Nord, and would like to say welcome to today's webinar. Um, and thank you for joining us as we um, kick off Nord's Project RDAC Toolkit meeting, creating a rare disease advisory council in your state. We'll say that Nord's goal really is to try to establish um, RDACs in every one of the states in this country this year or as quickly as we can. And as you know, as you may or may not know, currently there's 16 RDACs that are up and running in various states and another 12 that are um, in various stages of organization moving forward. So we're about halfway there. And I wanna say that NORD's Rare Action Network ambassadors and volunteers have really played a critical role in helping launch a number of these. And we hope to hear from some, we, you will hear from at least three of those people today. And uh, we look forward to their comments. We know that building a diverse coalition of rare disease community stakeholders is really critical in being able to implement RDACs and make them work effectively. And so our endeavor to put together these toolkits is really an effort to help provide those kinds of tools to you and guidance to you in your, um, in your everyday effort to try to make this happen. So today we look forward to hearing from a number of people that have helped this process along the way, learn about best practices, hear what they've done, learn about bumps in the roads and other opportunities that they've, that they've seen to, to make this really work successfully. So we thank you for joining us today. I want you to be aware also that the Nord staff is available and ready and willing to help in any phase of this along the way. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I hope you find it useful and helpful, but I, be remiss if I didn't thank our sponsors as well. There are a number of different companies that have played critical roles in helping us make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, that today was uh, able to be put on. That's Biogen, Bluebird Bio, Boringer Ingelheim, CSL Bearing, Horizon, Sarepta, and Vertex, all of whom have helped us uh, make this day possible. So a real special thanks to all of them for stepping up and helping us do that. So again, welcome. Hope you find it useful. Hope you find the information helpful and look forward to uh, our goal of putting an RDAC in every state as quickly as possible. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Heidi. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Rose Gallagher. Um, you actually have me instead of Heidi today. I, I wanna thank Peter for those um, opening remarks regarding Project RDAC. Um, as I said, I'm Rose, the Associate Director of Policy here at NORD and Project Manager for Project RDAC. Today, I'm just thrilled to have the opportunity to discuss our newly released toolkit, creating an RDAC in your state, and just step back for a second and to provide some more background on rare disease advisory councils at large across our country. First, though, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the rest of our incredible policy team here at NORD and introduce two of my colleagues, Anissa Reed and Elise Patel. Nord State Policy Managers, who will be joining me on today's webinar. As always, the Nord team and also don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions or concerns regarding Project RDAC or other issues at rdac at rarediseases.org. So, Let's get into it. What is an RDAC? I'd like to take a step back and review what exactly is a Rare Disease Advisory Council, or RDAC for short, before jumping into our newly released toolkit. Let's start with the problem. As we all know, more than 25 million Americans are living with one of the more than 7,000 known unique rare diseases. That breaks down to about one in 10 Americans. And even though that may seem like a lot, state decision makers still have limited awareness of the issues and impact that rare diseases have on patients, their caregivers, and the overall healthcare system every day. So what's the solution? Well, NORD believes it is to create RDACs, a diverse body to help advise state government on the common obstacles we face every day. We really see this just as an enormous opportunity to get together, to work as a community to address um, and prevent barriers in just a more strategic fashion. There are a number of differences between RDACs that include the number of members on their council, varied members throughout the rare disease community, 
everyone is involved from patients to caregivers, physicians, uh, industry partners, et cetera, on the council. We also see some differences in where the council works out of or is housed out of. Um, some states have chose to house their rare disease advisory councils out of the, their state department of health or a university system or even a nonprofit. Additionally, we've seen that some states um, have been able to secure funding and others have allowed um, the use of outside funding in order to support their rare disease advisory council. And finally, we see some differences in the duties and accountability measures, meaning kind of the, the bulk of the legislation. So what exactly is an RDAC going to do? And what are they required to do? Are they required to do a report, a number of meetings? It, it all looks different in every state, but at the end of the day, each RDAC has the same goal of supporting the rare disease community by increasing the voice of the patient and caregiver at the state level. So next up, I wanted to take a step back and explain um, and call out the amazing uh, states that have been able to enact rare disease advisory council legislation to date. You'll see on this slide that this, the 16 states that have been able to enact RDAC legislation are in orange, along with the year that they were enacted. Um, over the past few weeks, I'm happy to report that we've just added two more states to this growing list both Ohio and Massachusetts have enacted RDAC legislation. And I just wanna give a huge shout out to all of our amazing advocates that helped work on those efforts over the past few years. Um, it was a really big lift, but we're, we're proud to have those two states join this growing list. Additionally, one thing you may notice on this slide is that most RDACs have really been signed into law within the past uh, two state legislative sessions. So it's a relatively new idea um, North Carolina was the first state to establish an RDAC back in 2015, but from there the idea really just took off and patients and caregivers across our country continue to work on establishing these and NORD is proud to have uh, just recently launched Project RDAC to help ensure, as Peter said, that every state has an RDAC. So thank you to all of you who have helped advocate with us on this really important issue. So next up we'll be taking a closer look at the newly released toolkit, how to create an RDAC in your state. So the life cycle of an RDAC looks very different in every state from start to finish. However, there's three main phases, the coalition building phase, the legislative phase, and then the implementation phase. For today's purposes, this toolkit is really focused on the first phase, the coalition building phase. As Peter shared, Nord feels that this first phase is really important and critical to the overall success of RDACs. We found that in other states, when there's a strong coalition pushing from the start, that's all on the same page and is strategic, that the, those states have been more successful down the line so that once the legislation is passed, they're really able just to get in there and hit the ground running. So for today, we'll be starting um, on the establish a, a coalition bullet in the coalition phase, but you can expect in future toolkits for NORD to cover both the legislative and the implementation phase. So with that, I'm uh, happy to turn it over to my colleague, Anissa Reed to take a deeper dive into how to start building out your coalition. Great, thank you, Rose. Uh, my name is Anissa Reed and I'm NORD State Policy Manager for the Eastern Region. Today, I'm gonna be discussing a coalition building. In our toolkit, we have provided a step-by-step -step guide to coalition building because as Rose said, we have seen this phase as being critical to the overall success of the council. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, the first step in coalition building is recruiting members for the RDAC coalition. So on this slide, you'll find an example of some key players that we often see in our state's RDAC coalitions. However, coalitions in each state can look very different. Uh, it's important to have representation from a wide variety of stakeholders in the rare disease community since they each have a really unique perspective on rare diseases. Um, so patient organizations like nonprofits that operate within the state, uh, healthcare partners like doctors, nurses, geneticists, and hospital administrators, community members such as patients, advocates, and caregivers, industry partners, which typically consist of pharmaceutical and biotech companies, state agencies, uh, which often include the state's Department of Health, 
um, or the Department of Insurance as well, and educational institutions such as universities and academic institutions. Uh, when there is a div diverse representation from the start, we have found the RDAC has had a, a greater success rate. Great. Um, so as mentioned in the previous slide, you will first want to identify a group of folks who might be interested in participating in the coalition. So once you've done that, it's important to start bringing this group together to start connecting. You can get the word out by tapping into your existing network, asking your contacts to help you get the word out, and using social media. NORD has email templates available for you to use to do outreach and invite people to join your meeting, as well as social media templates. The NORD policy team is happy to set up a virtual platform for your first coalition meeting, uh, and we can assist you with spreading the word about your meeting to other advocates within your state. If you'd like assistance with setting up a virtual platform and getting the word out about your meeting, then you can contact us at rdac at rarediseases.org. Uh, so next it is time to begin coordinating and preparing for your first coalition meeting. Uh, create a mailing list for your new coalition to encourage the group to share resources, provide updates, and to share opportunities with the coalition. NORD has more tips and templates for coordinating and preparing your first meeting in the toolkit. Uh, your next step is to facilitate the meeting. Uh, try to stick to your agenda, but encourage an open and natural conversation. Be sure to give participants an opportunity to share feedback and to ask questions. If you're worried that you might have a quiet group, sometimes it's helpful to ask someone if they're comfortable sharing in advance. And the final step is to follow up on any action items prior to the meeting and work with Nord staff on the next steps. All right, so I am excited to introduce um, three of our Rare Action Network volunteer state ambassadors. So we have Tammy Jones from Arkansas, Anne Rugari from Florida, and Danny's son from Wisconsin. So each of them are in different phases of their coalition building process. So I would like to turn it out to them to share where they currently are in their coalition building process and um, get some tips from them. So first up we have Tammy. I think you're muted there, Tammy. Yes, yeah. I am, I'm so sorry. A good afternoon, welcome. I'm Tammy Jones. I'm the Arkansas Volunteer Rare Action Ambassador. That's a lot of words. Um, and you know, the my first uh, the first expression of interest that I had uh, in getting an RDAC in my state, I actually spoke with a Nord staff member. From there, wow, meeting call meeting started. Um, meeting calls began, and then the next thing I know, we have a steering committee put together, and we're formed to start our search for this comprehensive group that's going to fill our team. Um, you know, with a coalition meaning partnership, um, it means that we work together. It is it's, that's very important. Uh, ultimately, we're in the the baby stages, but I found our start to be smooth. Um, because we made the choice, and I firmly believe this is where our uh, strength came from, because we made a choice to reach out for guidance. Um, I didn't know a lot about RDAC, uh, yet I did know that I wanted to be part of a lead in um, putting this together to help others in my state. Um, I wanna say thanks, of course, to the Nord staff for taking my interest and just running with it. And that's what I feel like they did. Um, I mentioned it, they just took it and ran with it. And the next thing I know things were happening because it's so important to improve the quality of life for rare patients in our state. Then you may ask yourself, how do we make connections? How do we get coalition members? Well, my first con uh, first start was to look, for, look at people that I already know. People I know, people that I've met, uh, people that have become part of my contacts. And that was partly, um, of course, RAND membership, doctors, industry representatives, legislators, strong community supporters, and patients are two vital, vital factors here. Um, they all shared that if there was anything that they could do to help, they had that desire. So, you know, here we go. I want to leave you with this, this key. Realize this is a coalition partnership task. Just be open to building and working together 
to complete the task. Thank you. And now I'd like to pass it on to Annie Regeri from Florida. Thank you for that introduction, Tammy. Um, I'm Ann Regeri, one of the co-ambassadors in the state of Florida. Florida first began working uh, to form a rare disease advisory council in May of 2020. Uh, we reached out to the NORD team to learn about the steps in building an RDAP. Our Florida team then planned a webinar in June of 2020 to inform our community of the value of having an RDAC in Florida. We invited many key stakeholders in the rare disease space, including the patients, the caregivers, patient advocacy groups, public health personnel, physicians, nurses, hospital administrators, and many others to attend the, that webinar. Prior to the webinar, though, we did send out a survey via email and social media asking a variety of questions to help engage the community and to prep for the webinar. We wanted to engage them in educating them about the RDAC and to also begin building a coalition. We used those survey answers to help develop the framework for the webinar on the RDAC. Next, our Florida team worked on finding and contacting legislators to get a bill written. Once we found a legislator who would write the bill for us, the NORD team got involved in helping to write the language for the bill. Our bill was submitted this past December 2020, and it will be presented during the Florida 2021 legislation session, legislative session and hopefully passed. We continue to build our own and have outreach in the community to build the coalition that will help support in getting this bill passed. We keep a spreadsheet of all of, our of all of our contacts for the coalition so that we have easy access to email and contact information. Florida RAN is hosting another webinar January 21st for the purpose of building a stronger coalition for the Florida, uh, Florida RDAC. We hope to have many key people in the community participate in this webinar. And the focus of this webinar and coalition will uh, be to help push the legislation through and to create a task list of the unmet needs of the rare disease community so that we can improve the healthcare system in the state of Florida. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Danny Sun. Thank you, Anne. So um, my name is Danny Sun and I am um, I'm from Wisconsin, and we are just in the very beginning stages of building our coalition and support for um, our RDAC here. We have had one coalition meeting that was in December um, to start to talk about initial interests, but we're really taking our time to build that network of support as Tammy and Ann both talked about. This is just all about collaboration and it takes everyone's effort and support. And so we've followed Nord's recommendations that the stronger your coalition is, um, the more success um, successful your RDAC will be. So that's what we're working through right now. I think Tammy and Anne covered a lot of the um, logistics and outreach. I did similar things, but I thought I would list just a few specific strategies that I used to, for outreach when I started to think of who could we connect with and invite to join into this effort. Um, so uh, one thing I did was I went through and looked looked into all of our past, um, the last couple of years worth of events registrations. And um, that helped to remind me, maybe somebody who hadn't been involved recently, but had expressed interest previously, I, I wanted to make sure that I reached out to them um, and update them on what we were working on. I also was able to connect with NORD National Office staff and um, get access to the NORD membership organization list so I could reach out to those organizations and their local offices here in Wisconsin to invite them to participate as well. And then, of course, I did just a regular Google search of other um, organizations within Wisconsin that maybe we haven't connected with before, but might be interested in getting involved in this. And a big um, obvious uh, strategy is to reach out to other advocates in your state. Um, this was a great way for us to identify who might be some legislators that would be champions for the RDAC when we get to that point, because so many different advocates have different relationships with different um, legislators, and that'll be really important. So we reached out to them too. 
And something that has also been helpful is um, in this virtual year um, that we just finished in 2020, we had several um, virtual meetings. And so thinking about who came to those meetings and who was really interested, who consistently attended, who was involved, those are great people to reach out to and um, ask them for their interest and ask them if there's anybody else that they know of that they think might be interested. And one thing that I thought of when, um, I can't remember if it was Tammy or Anne was talking about helping to move along the conversation meetings, one thing that I did was when I was preparing for our first meeting, I looked at who was registered and who was going to be coming and I thought ab ahead about what was some of the work that those people had done prior to, um, or while I had known them, some of the advocacy work, what were the areas that were really important to them that they advocated for. And then when we were having those conversations, <clears throat> excuse me, I could ask specifically, um, hey, so and so I know you have worked a lot on newborn screening could you talk about how you think maybe an RDEC could help your efforts or could help challenges that you faced while, while you've been doing your work? So those are just some tips that um, I would like to share, specific strategies to help you as you uh, move forward in this process. And I think I am turning it back to Elise. Perfect. Thank you, Danny, and good afternoon, everyone. I am Elise Patel, Nord State Policy Manager for the Western Region, and I wanted to remind everyone that we will have time at the end of our presentation today for questions and answers, so please feel free to send them through our, the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. Today, I'll be sharing with you guys some ideas to help your coalition identify your state's needs. This step is critical to help form the RDAC duties listed in the legislation that will be needed to create an RDAC. From our experience, we found that the stronger the bill language can be, the increased likelihood that the RDAC can hit the ground running after enactment. There have been a lot of different ways to identify your state's needs, but we wanna share a few that have been particularly effective from our perspective. The first is by conducting a SWOT analysis, which helps identify current strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for the rare disease community. By completing a SWOT analysis, the coalition will be provided a glimpse of what is currently in place and what can potentially be used in the state's RDAC legislation um, for better, to better support the community. It is important for, a, for the analysis to be tailored to your specific state since each state's rare disease community has unique needs. In the toolkit, you will find a SWOT analysis template that you're welcome to use for your coalition. Another tool to help identify your state's needs is NORD's annual state policy report card, which provides a landscape analysis of policies at the state level that impact the rare disease community. And it can serve as a useful tool to help educate you and your coalition on where your state stands on key policies. The issues outlined in the report card as seen on this slide touch on several critical and relevant policy areas. However, we understand that there are still other policy areas that impact the lives of rare disease patients. The report card is meant to be a starting point to help educate the RDAC coalition and our newest report card edition will be available in just a few weeks. And finally, another way to guide the RDAC coalition in developing the RDAC legislation is through an open discussion within the community. And this can be accomplished by hosting a public meeting um, and through one-on-one -on -one conversations with rare disease stakeholders. Uh, through your meetings and conversations, you'll be able to better understand the challenges members of the rare disease community face, resources that might be helpful, and other areas that could be addressed within an RDAC. And in our toolkit, you will find helpful questions to facilitate these conversations. Please know that whichever methods your coalition chooses to use to determine your state's needs, our NORD staff is here to support you in this process. And I will now turn it over to Rose to share how you can get involved in your RDAC efforts in your state. Great. Thanks, Elise. Um, now I'd like to jump into some next steps um, and how you can get more involved with Project RDAC in the, in the coming months here. So um, after today's presentation, if you're interested in getting more involved in starting an RDAC in your state or joining an existing coalition, I would encourage you to check out first if your state 
has an RDAP, you can head over to the Project RDAP website. Um, and after that, if you find that your state already has an RDAC, um, Nord staff would be happy to connect you to that RDAC. It's, uh, you can reach out to us via our RDAC email, rdac at rarediseases.org. Or if there's no existing RDAC or no effort underway, Nord would also be happy to, to start this process with you on building out your RDAC coalition. So next up, I wanted to touch on uh, the existing RDAC resources that NORD has created. Um, at this time, NORD has created several resources to help make this process as easy as possible, and we have more on the way. The goal is really to make this um, really straightforward, and we want everyone to succeed in working on an RDAC. And so to date, we've created the following uh, resources. First up, uh, we've created a, coalition, a coalition planning sheet. So as Elise talked about when you're working on, excuse me, as Anissa talked about, when you're working on building out your coalition, we have a planning sheet that includes um, some of the players that we recommend that you reach out to. In addition, we've created an email template um, that's very easy to use that you can reach out to these um, coalition partners and invite them to be part of this effort. Additionally, we've created a social media toolkit to help raise awareness on an RDAC in your state and any um, upcoming coalition meetings. We've also established a sample agenda that you can use to lead your meeting along with a PowerPoint for that first meeting. And then when you're ready to get into identifying your state's needs, as Elise talked about, we have a SWOT analysis template um, that you can use to guide that discussion. And finally, we have um, a one pager that provides a great overview of RDACs across our country and a map of where they currently exist and an RDAC and RDAC model language. So that's model bill language that you can use in that next legislative phase um, to help introduce an RDAC. So we hope that you find these resources helpful and we really do look forward to working alongside of you to make an RDAC a reality in your state. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the toolkit. Of course, we spent um, most of the time today talking about um, what, what was in the toolkit and we hope that you found this sneak peek helpful. But if you're interested in continuing to work on this effort with us or wanna check out the toolkit, we would encourage you to request the RDAC toolkit on the Project RDAC website. Um, and from there, Nord staff will follow up and get started on with working with you on establishing an RDAC. And then we have some future Project RDAC opportunities. Um, over the coming weeks, we have ongoing state coalition meetings um, to help identify your state's needs and push for RDAC legislation. You can check out the Project RDAC website under the events tab to see when your state is hosting one next. Um, in the coming weeks so far, we have ones for California, Florida, New Jersey, and Texas, but be on the lookout as more will be added soon. Additionally, as I talked about, um, we have more toolkits coming. We're excited to bring out the legislative and the implementation phase toolkits um, over the coming months here. We really do see these as a great tool to help advance RDACs across the country. And then lastly, uh, many of you were able to join us for our December Project RDAC kickoff meeting where we were able to hear from existing RDAC leaders across the country on some of the successes and early um, challenges that they've faced. Um, we've put up the recording if you missed it on our Project RDAC website and would encourage you to check it out. Um, and then finally, we have our next big stakeholders meeting in July 2021 of this year. So stay tuned for more details on that, but we're excited to um, host a similar meeting to the one in December to bring everyone together again to talk about where we are in July and hopefully we'll have some more um, exciting news like Ohio and Massachusetts to report. And then um, lastly, I, I wanted to talk about Nord's Rare Action Network a little bit. Um, so please do um, sign up for the Rare Action Network. If you haven't already, you can head over to Nord's uh, Rare Action Network website at rareaction.org. From there, you're able to do a quick form and sign up for the Rare Action Network email. So you'll be the first to know from now on if there's a coalition meeting or if we have an advocacy effort underway and we need your help, we often deploy what we call action alerts. So for example, um, when we were working towards the end of last year of securing um, the Massachusetts and Ohio RDACs, we sent out emails to our advocates asking them to 
to help us uh, push for this legislation. It's a really easy thing you can do from the comfort of your own home or you just fill out a quick form letter to your legislators, letting them know why an RDOC would be important to you. So we have similar efforts across the country whenever we work on these. So I would encourage you to join Words for Action Network so you can stay in the know. Um, and then finally, um, we have plenty of time um, for questions today, um, but if we don't get to all of them or you have, you think of a question after the fact, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at the RDAC at rarediseases.org email and Nord staff will be happy to follow up um, in the coming days here um, to discuss any of your questions or concerns. So with that, um, let's get into the q and I know we've had um, several great, great questions uh, come through the chat, but I wanted to start with the first one. Um, it was a question about um, if there can be more than one RDAC in a state. So I would encourage to all of the presenters from today, if you could come back on, on camera um, in case there's questions for you too. So um, can there be more than one RDAC in one state? I'm, I'm happy to take a, the first crack at that question. Um, the answer is, is no, we're really looking, um, the goal is to establish one RDAC. A state only needs one RDAC um, to represent the rare disease community. Um, and that's why we really encourage you to reach out to us to either connect you with the existing effort um, or get started with, with working with us on an RDAC effort in your state. Um, the more strategic we can be and the more we can work together, um, as we've talked about today, the greater success we see down the line. Um, and additionally, um, one RDAC, um, you know, can advise state government together and there's plenty of roles on, on an RDAC, um, as we talked about from um, the patients to caregivers to the physicians to nurses um, to patient advocacy organizations and, and the list goes on. So there's plenty of room on an RDAC to, to use your voice and, and raise the profile of rare diseases at the state level. But again, just one, one RDAC per state. Um, so next I wanted to, there's a question um, on how, how we can connect to other people in our state that are on this call um, if they're interested in starting an RDAC. And I'd love to throw it over now to um, Anissa. Um, would you be able to answer that? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So um, I would recommend shooting us an email at uh, our RDAC email address. RDAC at rarediseases.org. Um, we would be happy to also link you on how to become a RAND member, which is quick and easy. And then we can come together and either invite you to our next coalition meeting, or we can discuss how to get a coalition meeting um, off the ground in your state. So you'll probably be connected to myself if you live on the Eastern region or Elise if you're on the Western region. Awesome. Thanks, Anissa. Um, another great question that came through the chat is what's the difference between Nord's Rare Action Network and an RDAC? Um, so I'd love to throw that over to Elise first, and then I'd also love our RAND volunteers um, to come off mute and talk a little bit about um, what the Rare Action Network does in your state. Elise? Thank you, Rose. Yeah, so our Rare Action Network is our wonderful group of volunteers that are active within every state. Um, so we definitely would recommend if you're interested in following our policy work, not only on RDACs, but all of the work that we do in the policy arena to sign up to become a RAND member so that you can be informed of everything that's happening in your state. Um, that's the best way to stay engaged as far as what we're working on. And then also you're given access to take part in different um, action alerts or reaching out to your legislators throughout the year. Um, so that's a great resource to get involved. And then the RDAC itself would be, um, you know, once it's established in your state, that's the body that can help the community and legislators work together in a cohesive way to address the needs in your state um, for the rare disease community. So um, joining the RDAC coalition is a great way to get involved in that specific effort. But I would say if you're looking to get involved in all the different things we work on, definitely become a RAND member. Any volunteers that want to jump in and share a little bit more? I will just, I'll just follow up uh, what Elise is saying. And, and a lot of it is they're most definitely getting involved because 
if once you plug in to the Rear Action Network, um, I mean, we had monthly phone calls where we got together with with all of our RAND members over the state. So that is important. So if you're not a RAND member, go to your state website and and join RAND. Then um, in that, as a you know, as an ambassador, we lead and we try to just support. We give a lot of support to um, the RAND members and the patients, and we do events. Um, and then RDAC just happened to come because it was for me, because I wanted to see more more happening. So you know, in our virtual world, it hasn't been the same as we all know, but we uh, managed to accomplish a lot uh, with virtual with North this summer or this past year. So most definitely, being a RAN uh, member, it, you're part of whatever we do that you want to to plug into. So. That just is a smaller group of us that gets a lot larger, we hope, to come together and then we learn and we work together to build things like the R deck. Anne, were you gonna say something? I was gonna say one of the fun things that we get to do is share in rare disease day, which is the last mm -hmm. day of February. And we try to plan events and with Florida being such a big state, we try to find some central locations and um, this year it'll be a virtual event. And all the states usually try to host some kind of events on Rare Disease Day, just to bring a great awareness to the community that there, it, it, to the world and to the state in general, that there are rare diseases that exist. And our community is very much one in 10 Americans living with some kind of rare disorder. So looking to participate in a rare disease event, whether you're an advocate, a patient organization, a legislator, a medical professional, really contact your state RAN and get involved in that because that's really a key um, key event for all of us here in each state. Yeah, I think you all covered it. I would just comment that it really is like a social, it's a, it's a support network too. So even if you are not, um, maybe the RDAC or getting involved with legislation is intimidating to you or you're not sure where to start, you can always reach out and get involved in other ways. Um, and it's really just about networking and getting to hear what other people are working on, what's important to them. And then also just coming alongside one another um, for support and solidarity in, in all of the efforts that everyone has. So it's a, it's a much broader scope of of activities as opposed to the RDAC, which is a specific kind of program that we would be working on. Awesome. Great, thank you everyone for jumping in there. We have another question that came through about um, what's the difference between the, the coalition and the RDAC itself? And are there a, a capped number of members who are for the coalition versus the RDAC? Um, Anissa, would you be able to jump in there? Sure. So the difference between the RDAC and the RDAC coalition is the RDAC coalition are the key players who will focus on discussing their state needs, what they would like to see included in their RDAC and really coming together as a community to plan that legislation um, to discuss what's important to them and what barriers face in their state since every state is of course different. So when it comes to the number of coalition members, we don't have a specific policy that says we're capping it. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Elise and Rose, the largest number was around 40 in one of the states. Um, so when it comes to coalitions, I mean, I would recommend between 20 and, and 25 is a good number um, from my experience so far. And when it comes to the actual RDOC is that is when that legislation is passed through and signed into law. Um, and then that would be a, an actual application process. So we recommend about 12 to 15 members on an RDAC. Every state looks very different. Um, some states have about 12, I think some it goes up to 30. So the state really comes together and discusses who they feel would be an important piece of that puzzle. And then they work together and pass it through and, um, and that's what it typically looks like. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Anissa. Just to piggyback off of what Anissa was saying, too, um, it does look different in every state, the number of members on a council and, and who's involved on the council. And that's really to ensure that an RDAC is specific to, to meet the needs of a state. 
Um, we really don't want our DACs to look the same across the board. We want them to be um, state specific. And that's why this coalition phase is important because it's a time to come together and discuss um, what's, what's critically important in your state and identifying where you need to make improvements. And then that's what can inform the, the legislation. Um, I can just add one more point to that too. Um, even if you aren't on the RDAC as an official member, uh, many RDACs have ways that the public can also engage. So whether it's giving feedback, um, social media, um, there's ways for people to still be involved in that process. Exactly. Um, well, speaking of involvement, um, a question came through about Florida. Um, Anne, are you in need of uh, coalition members in Florida and how can we get more involved there? Awesome. That's a great question. And yes, we're looking for members and we're going to have our first meeting or first uh, gathering January 21st and then have a meeting shortly after that. So if you want to get involved, please, you can reach out ann.regary at rareaction.org, sorry, .org, and let us know that you want to be involved and also sign up to participate on our Florida brand uh, Facebook page to sign up for the webinar. So we would love to get some more members involved and thanks for reaching out. That's great. And Tammy and, and Danny, if, if folks want to get more involved in Arkansas and Wisconsin, how can they go about doing that? Danny, go first. Okay. Since we always, she always has to repeat everything. So we're going to put it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I did actually put in the chat because someone had reached out about wanting to get more involved in Wisconsin. So I did include my um, email in the chat. Is that open to everybody? The chat is, right, Rose? Um, it is, it's more like a q and A. I I think, specific to okay. one. But if you want to get involved in Wisconsin, email us at the RDAC at rarediseases.org and we'll be sure to link you up with Danny um, or Kim or Ann. Yep, yep. Then we can get you signed up with the Wisconsin emails that go out and you'll be up to date on, on everything. Well, also uh, in our states, as the ambassador, we, of course, we have a, a Facebook page. So you can always uh, find us through that Facebook page. Um, and so, because it would be your state uh, at Arkansas at Rare Action Network. So you would be able to be able to find that. You'll find that information. But um, the biggest thing is just reaching out, um, knowing that if you can't find us uh, without going through a lot of channels, go straight to Nord. You know, you can find them on, on just about everything. If you put if you put in Rare, you're going to see some things from Nord pop up, which is great. So yes, we we want you involved. And let me just say that. If you are not part of the coalition, then um, we're going to be cheerleaders. You know, whoever whoever does not fall into that once we get it built, we're going to be cheerleaders. We're going to kind of be the feet that that gets it out there across our state. So um, that's all. That's also very vital. Just knowing that we just need to get started. Just take that first step, and we can all walk together through it. That's a great point, Tammy. Thanks for raising that that point because um, joining a coalition and attending meetings, we, we realize that everyone, you know, can't make time for that. It's it's still um, an ongoing crazy time for everyone at home. But there are other ways to ensure that you, you know, and support your state's creation of an RDAC. As I said, if you sign up for the reaction.org emails, you'll get alerts when there's an opportunity to engage. So when the RDAC's been, you know, introduced in the legislature, for example, and we, we want, you know, legislators to know that the whole community supports this idea um, and they, they want to hear from you on it. We'll send out an email um, requesting that you contact your legislators and we really try and make it as easy as possible. Um, we send out a, a tailored letter where you just have to, sorry, a, a website where you just throw in your address and then it pops up um, with a sample letter that you can edit and then send right off to your legislators. So that's another good way to get engaged and support your RDAC if you're unable to be part of the coalition. And another important point that I wanted to know, um, you know, just because um, you're involved in the coalition, it's a critical, critical part of the RDAC uh, process. And um, that phase slide that I showed earlier, the coalition um, versus legislative and then the implementation, it's a critical um, part of the overall establishment of an RDAC. But just because that you're part of the coalition, that is separate from, from the RDAC. Um, and so, 
to in order to get on your state's RDAC, that process looks different in every state, but normally there's some level of, of application, an application that you have to fill out in order to be on to be on your state's RDAC. Um, so with that, we have another, another good question that came through. If there's already an established RDAC in my state, how can I connect with that RDAC and, and get more involved? Um, Elise, can you answer that one? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I, again, your best resource is probably to send us an email at that RDAC at rarediseases.org. Um, we're happy to then reach out to you specifically about your state um, and how you can connect with your existing RDAC if there is one. Um, so we're happy to do that. And I also wanted to point out, we also have a wonderful resource on our website, site rarediseases.org. There's a section that is um, specifically for Project RDAC. And on there we list, um, we have a one pager, we have various resources, and we also have a tab that allows you to look at an interactive map that breaks down RDACs by state. So you can actually take a look at that map and see where your state is in that project. Um, process, whether they have an RDAC established, one that's um, in formation, or if they haven't done anything yet, we could get something started. That's great, Elise. I also wanted to piggyback on that and share that many RDACs um, at the state level are open to the public. Some of their meetings are not all open to the public, but many of them, and that's something that NORD pushes for um, in our legislation, we really want these meetings to be open to the public at the state level. And so um, after you reach out to us, we're happy to, to connect you with your RDAC and make sure that if there is an upcoming public meeting that you have the opportunity to attend as much of them, as many of them right now are of course virtual, just like uh, taking place on the Zoom platform like today. Um, well, with that, we have another, another question that came through. Um, does the coalition remain in place once the RDAC is created? Um, I can take a stab at that, but then Elise and Anissa, feel free to jump in. It's a great question. Um, the coalition is just such a key piece to the overall success of the RDAC, um, and it can still serve a role after the RDAC is created. Um, but typically, a lot of those members um, end up um, do end up on on the RDAC. Some of them, I should say. Um, but there's still things that the coalition can do after the fact to support and ensure that the RDAC remains successful and meets all of the requirements that are outlined in the legislation. As I talked about earlier, um, there's what we call the duties and accountability measures and in, in, in legislation. So the duties section, we really push to ensure it's um, state specific and that's what you'd work on with your coalition to come up with the ideas to inform the duties section of the language. And then the accountability section is, um, you know, how do we know that this RDAC is successful, for example? Um, does it need to have a report? Does it need to have a number of public meetings? Does it need to have a website? All of those things are um, the coalition after the fact can, you know, can help support and ensure that those things get done and, and monitor the RDAC. Um, because after the RDAC is, is passed and signed into law, the advocacy phase is so important and, and critical, um, but it's often what comes after and making sure that the RDAC and, for example, um, a lot of times in states, it's, it's the governor that needs to make the appointments. It's making sure that all of that stuff is done in a timely fashion. And sometimes that takes the coalition after the fact, continuing to push and ensure that the RDAC is established in, in the right way. So I would say the coalition and RDAC, to summarize, are still two very different things, but even after an RDAC is signed into law, sometimes that coalition still plays a critical role to push for the establishment and make sure it's set up in the way that they imagined. Anything else I missed there? No, but Rose, I just, I just wanted to add that um, one of the most powerful tools that we have as individuals that is not hard, we can't, we can't mess it up, is our story. Sharing our story make such an impact on pretty much everything we do. And of course, going into our deck and just the needs that, that rare patients have. So it's very vital. If, if your story is something that you're willing to share, please reach out to your you know, RAN ambassadors and, um, and work with them because we can use those uh, on our Facebook page with permission. There are so many things that we can do that's going to heighten um, why we need this RDAC and why we need it to be strong and healthy. Exactly. That's a great point, Tammy. Um, well, now um, I have another question that came through. How can biotech companies that specialize in rare disease research and treatment 
get involved in RDAX. Um, Anissa? Yeah, thank you. Um, that is, of course, a really important perspective that we want to hear um, in our rare disease community. So you are welcome to participate in one of our coalition meetings, provide your insight, uh, discuss your state's needs, and then some of our RDACs, um, several of them do have a spot for someone in the biotech world to eventually be a council member if they um, apply after that legislation is passed through. So we would love to connect with you and um, and, and learn more about your interests and, and your state needs, so. Exactly, yeah, these coalition meetings, um, as we've talked about, are, are open to everyone and we wanna make sure that everyone from the rare disease community has a seat at the table. Um, everyone's voice is just so critical especially at, at this coalition phase, if we haven't emphasized it enough today, it's just a really critical time to hear from everyone, um, to brainstorm together, and as I said, get on the same page about what can, what can go into the legislation so that we make an RDAC that is really a uh, high functioning and resource for the entire rare disease community in that state. Um, so with that, um, one more question, um, are there, um, how do you find out the status of and integrate into RDAC, act, RDAC activities already underway in your state? Um, sometimes states can have multiple um, multiple rare disease groups, which one is the official one that's working on the RDAC group and how does one join? It's a great question. Um, I can take this one. Um, there's no official RDAC group at, at the state level, but NORD is um, helping lead the way with our, with our great ambassadors, some of who are on the line today and our coalition meetings are of course open to anyone interested in supporting RDAC legislation at the state level. So again, we just encourage that you reach out to us and we can ensure that you get connected um, with the right group at, at the state level um, and, and can help your state implement an RDAC. Um, another question. Um, Maybe this one could be for our, our volunteers. Um, this is a little off base of RDACs, but also wanted to provide an opportunity for you to talk about your role as an ambassador and what that means, um, because you're working alongside of us to create this legislation at the state level. Can you just speak to how you, what is an ambassador and how you, um, how you can find out more about being an ambassador? Tammy, do you wanna start since you're off mute? Okay. Um... Well, first of all, a role as an ambassador is, I kind of consider myself sort of an organizer and cheerleader um, because you want to engage, uh, you want to engage other people in your state um, that have rare and that are, have not had that contact. Some just have not really had a connection anywhere. So uh, as an ambassador, it's, it's our position to make sure that we are going across our state. Uh, you know, one of the goals for 2020 was for um, me to try to hit all four corners of Arkansas. And guess what, ladies, it happened. It happened virtual, but it happened. So that's, you know, that's important. So there is, there's someone or more than someone on all four corners of the state of Arkansas that uh, are very involved and anxiously waiting for what they can do next. So, um, how to become an ambassador? Well, it's a, of course, an application process. Um, it was very, you know, it was lengthy, but it was so, it just covered everything. And uh, that's important. That also kind of gives you um, looking at a role as an ambassador that, wow, you know, we know that we can feel pretty secure and safe that NORD is doing everything that they need to do to make sure that the best um, is coming from their ambassadors. And I'll pass it to one of the others. <laughs> I think you I think you covered it quite a bit, Tammy. It's really just a, um, it's like, it's a networking role, I feel like. It's just bringing people together. And also, um, one thing I've noticed is sometimes, because a lot of us who are, who sought out to be an ambassador. We have had some experience with advocacy and just noted that we wanted to do more. Um, and so that's how we got connected. And so I've noticed that just in having conversations with people throughout the state, sometimes they'll bring up a problem or a challenge that they're facing. And um, 
I can utilize the resources at Nord and also some of my past experience to talk about, hey, that that's probably something that we could address or how can we get connect, how can we help you get connected with your legislator and, and help to support that process and help people to feel more comfortable connecting with um, legislators to talk about policy issues when they're really just life issues that we have, right? That we need some help, um, a little bit of extra steam behind to, to solve the problem. So um, that's one, one part of that role that I think is really important, but otherwise just bringing people together, raising awareness, that's our goal. Yeah, Tammy and Danny, you, you summed it up really well. And the only piece that I could add to it is, you know, the people that are in the rare disease community sometimes just need somebody to listen to what their unmet needs are and to be someone that can listen and possibly connect them with someone that can help. And NORD is such a great organization that can help on so many levels, whether it be insurance paying out, you know, getting, getting maybe medications that are needing, how to navigate through really murky waters and having a rare disease, you know, getting, finding out ways to get medical bills paid and get, support treatments and new treatments advocating for them. And I think it's just an education piece and it's just to be the voice, you know, just to be the voice and be the listener to the community and see where we can help. And, um, you know, being, being, a, being a volunteer for the National Organization of Rare Disorders is such an honor to be able to help that community. Well, thank you, Anne. That's that's really nice of you to say. Um, we're so happy to have all three of you as our ambassadors um, here at Nord. Um, I have we're running low on time here. We have a few more questions to address. Um, this one is for Anissa. Um, given the current you know culture at the state level, there's a lot of budget issues and um, related to COVID. Um, is it still possible and worth working on an RDAC right now? Yes, absolutely. That's something that we often hear. There, are, People are a little bit nervous that because there's a lot of state budget issues or other is areas of focus that it won't pass through and it might not be worth working on. We've actually seen a lot of states and most recently, as we mentioned, Ohio and Massachusetts were able to swiftly pass it on through and it was signed into law um, because it is a really important piece in the rare disease community with COVID with their um, suppressed immune systems and a lot of the diseases. And so it, it can absolutely also be linked to the COVID world as well. And there is not typically a fiscal note that is attached to it either. So it doesn't run into state budget issues. So there's still hope. We're seeing a lot of great legislation that's been introduced related to RDAC. So um, just know that that's, it's definitely worth focusing on in your state. Yeah, thanks Anissa. And just to add on top of that too, I mean, even though um, you know we are seeing success, as Anissa said, and being able to introduce legislation, but even if it's maybe not your year for your state, and we talk to legislators, and um, it's they think that it's too hard of a climate to introduce. We haven't encountered that yet, but if I'm, you know, for example, it did happen, um, it's still there's still things that you can do right now without without you know working towards the legislation this year. You can still work on you know creating a really strong coalition um, as some of our volunteers talked about today. I mean, they've been working on this now for, for several months. So um, it does take time, but Nord staff is always here to help you and, and support you on that endeavor. Um, in the final, final minute here, um, we had one question about where the existing um, coalitions are being formed and where there's pending legislation. So I'd be happy um, to take that as the final question today. Um, so where there's currently legislation, um, there's legislation active in Mis Michigan, New Hampshire, South Carolina, California, and Georgia. So if you want to be connected to any of those states actively working and that have a bill introduced, there's still time to get involved. I would just again encourage you to reach out to us. And then there's several states where the coalitions are still being formed out, like we talked about today. And um, we have Tammy on from Arkansas mm -hmm. and Ann from Florida and Danny from Wisconsin, but we're also working in Texas, Virginia, Washington, and Kansas. And um, if there's, you don't see your state on here and you head to the Project RDAC website and your state doesn't have an RDAC again, and just let's, let's start working on one. Let's work together and, and create an RDAC. Um, so given that, um, I wanna turn back on the, the slides to do a, a one more thank you. 
Wanted to give one more thank you to our Project RDAC supporters, um, Biogem, Bluebird Bio, Bowringer Engelheim, CSL Bearing, Horizon, Sarepta, and Vertex for their ongoing support of Project RDAC. And I also wanted to give um, a big shout out to you all for joining us today. We so appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to learn more about Project RDAC and our first toolkit, how to create an RDAC in your state. And we look forward to, to working with you on creating one alongside you. So thank you again for joining us today. And any questions, don't hesitate to reach out at rdac at rarediseases.org. Stay safe and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.